Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. Late October, year of the depend adult undergarment. Open me another one of those, boy, and I'll tell you the highlight of that season of my season tickets was I got to see that incredible son of bitch set, his first record in the flesh. It was your brother's Cub Scout troop out and you wouldn't join because I remember when you were afraid you'd lose the online time in front of the TP. Remember? Well, I always remember this one day, boy. It was against Syracuse. What? Eight seasons back, the little son of a bitch had a long time, 73 that day, and an average of 60 freaking nine. 73 for Christ's sake, open me another one, boy. Use the exercise. I will call the sky was cloudy. When he punted, you spent a real long time studying the sky. They really hung. He had a long hang time of 8.3 seconds that day. That was serious hanging, boy. Me? I never would five in my day. Christ, the whole troop said they never heard anything like the sound of that son of a bitch of 73. Juan Richardson. You remember Wani? The troop leader, whatever. Petroleum jelly salesman at a book line. Juan is a retired pilot from the service, from Obama squadron. Wani, we've down at the pod that night, Wani. Says he says that 73 sounded like just fucking bomb sounded, that kind of quacking whomp when they hit to the boys in the squadron in the planes when they let them go. The radio show, right before Madame Psychosis's midnight show on MLT Semi Underground WYYY, is those were the legends that formerly were. One of those cruel tech collegiate formats where any U.S. student who wants to can dart over from the Super Collider Lab or the Fourier Transform Study Group for 15 minutes and read on air some parodic thing where he'd pretend to be his own dad, apotheosizing some sort of thick-necked, historic athletic figure the dad admired and had by implication compared with woeful distaste to the pencil-necked, big-headed, asthmatic little kid staring up through the Coke bottle lenses from his digital keyboard. The show's only rule is that you have to read your thing in the voice of some really silly cartoon character. There are other rather more exotic patricidal formats for Asian, Latin, Arab, and European students on select weekend evenings. The consensus is Asian cartoon characters have the silliest voices. Albeit literally sophomoric, Those Were the Legends is a useful drama therapy type catharsis up. MIT students tend to carry their own special psychic scars. Nerd, geek, dweeb, wonk, fag, weenie, four-eye, spazola, limp dick, needle dick, dickless, dick nose, pencil neck. Getting your violin or laptop TP or entomologist kill jar broken over your large head by thick-necked kids on the playground. And the show pulls down solid FM ratings, though a lot of that's due to reverse inertia. A Newton's Second law like backward shove from the rapidly popular Madame Psychosis Hour. Monday through Friday, O O O hour to one hundred hour, which it proceeds. YDAU's WYYY late shift student engineer, unfond of any elevator that follows a serpentine or vascular path, eschews the MIT student union's elevator. He has an arrival routine where he skips the front entrances and comes in through the south side's acoustic meters and gets a millennial fizzy out of the vending machine in the cephanoid sinus, then descends creaky back wooden stairs from the masses intermedia's reading room down to about the infundibular recess, past the Tech Talk Daily CD-ROM student paper's production floor, and the sick chemical smell of the read-only cartridge press's developer, down past the epiglottal Hillel Club's dark and star-doored HQ, past the heavier door to the tiled lattice of hallways, to the squash and racquetball courts, and one volleyball court and the airy corpus callosum, 
of 24 high ceiling tennis courts, endowed by an MIT alum, and now so little use they don't even know where the nets are. Down three more levels to the ghostly clean and lithium-lit studios of FM 109 WYYY FM, broadcasting for the MIT community and selected points beyond. The studio's walls are pink and laryngeally fissured. His asthma's better down here, the air thin and keen, the tracheal air filters just below the flooring, and the ventilators air the freshest in the union. The engineer, a work-study graduate student with bad lungs and occluded pores, settles alone at his panel in the engineer's booth, adjusts a couple needles bob, and sound checks the only paid personality on the nightly docket the darkly revered Madame Psychosis, whose cameo shadow is just visible under the booth's thick glass. Her screen half obscuring the on-air studio's bank of phones, checking queuing and transition for the Thursday edition. She is hidden from all view by a jointed triptych screen of cream chiffon that glows red and green in the lights of the phone bank, and the queuing panels dials and frames her silhouette. Her silhouette is cleanly limbed against the screen, sitting cross-legged in its insectile, microphonic headset, smoking. The engineer always has to tighten his own headset's cranial band down from those were engineer's mammoth parietal breath. He activates the intercom and offers to check Madame Psychosis's levels. He requests sound, anything at all. He hasn't opened his can of pop. There's a long silence, during which Madame Psychosis's silhouette doesn't look up from something she looks like she's collating at her little desk. After a while, she makes some little sounds, little plosives to check for roaring sounds and exhalations, a perennial problem in low budget FM. She makes a long S sound. The student engineer takes a hit from his portable inhaler. She says, He liked that sort of dreamy, dreaming music that had the rhythm of long things swinging. The engineer's movements at the panel's dials resemble someone adjusting the heater and sound system while driving. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao, she says. The engineer age 23, has extremely bad skin. Attractive paraplegic female seeks same object. The windowless laryngeal studio is terribly bright. Nothing casts a shadow. Recessed lit fluorescence with a dual spectrum, lithiumized corona developed two buildings over an awaiting ONAN patent the chilly, shadowless light of surgical theaters, convenience stores at 0400. The pink, wrinkled walls sometimes looked more gynecological than anything else. Like most marriages, theirs was the evolved product of concordance and compromise. The engineer shivers in the bright chill and lights a gasper of his own and tells Madame Psychosis through the intercom that the whole range of levels is fine. Madame Psychosis is the only W-Y-Y-Y personality who brings in her own headset and jacks, plus a triptych screen. Over the screen's left section are four clocks set for different zones, plus a numberless disc someone hung for a joke to designate the annularized Great Concavity's no time. The EST clock's trackable hand carves off the last few seconds from the five minutes of dead air Madame Psychosis's contract stipulates gets to proceed her show. You can see her silhouette putting out the cigarette very methodically. She cues tonight synthesized bumper and theme music. The engineer flicks a lever and pumps the music up the coaxial medulla and through the amps and boosters packed into crawl spaces above the high fall ceiling of the Corpus Colossum's idle tennis courts, and up and out the aerial that protrudes from the gray and bulbous surface of the Union's roof. Institutional design has come away from IMPE, MIT's near-new student union, 
off the corner of Ames and Memorial Drive. East Cambridge is one enormous cerebral cortex of reinforced concrete and polymer compounds. Madame Psychosis is smoking again, listening, head cocked. Her tall screen will leak smoke for her show's whole hour. The student engineer is counting down from five on an outstretched hand. He can't see how she sees. And as Pinky meets Palm, she says what she's said for three years of midnights. An opening bit that Mario Incandenza, the least cynical person in the history of Enfield M.A., across the river, listening faithfully, finds for all its black cynicism terribly compelling. Her silhouette leans and says, And lo, for the earth was empty of form and void, and darkness was all over the face of the deep. And we said, Look at that fucker dance. A toneless male voice is then cued in to say it's sixty minutes more or less with Madame Psychosis on YYY 109, largest hole prime on the FM band. The different sounds are encoded and pumped by the student engineer up through the building's corpus and out the roof's aerial. This aerial, low watt, has been rigged by the station's EM weenies to tilt and spin, not unlike the centrifugal theme park type ride, spraying the signal in all directions. Since the BS 1966 Hunt Act, the low watt fringe of the FM band are the only part of the wireless spectrum still licensed for public broadcast. The deep water green of FM tuners all over the campus's labs and dorms and barnacled clots of grad apartments align themselves slowly toward the spider's center, moving towards the dial's right, a little creepily, like plants toward light they can't even see. Ratings are minor league by the pre-interlaced broadcast standards of yore, but they are rock-solid consistent. Audience demand for Madame Psychosis has been, from the very start, inelastic. The aerial, inclined at about the angle of a three-kilometer cannon, spins in a blurred ellipse. Its rotary base is elliptical because that's the only shape E.M. Weenies could rig a mold for. Obstructed on all sides by the tall buildings of East Cambridge and Commercial Drive and Sirius downtown, though only a couple thin pie slices of signal escape MIT proper, e.g. through the P.E. department gap of barely used lacrosse and soccer fields between the philology and low-temp physics complexes on M. Drive and then across the florid purple nighttime breath of the historic Charles River, then through the heavy flow of traffic on Storrow Drive, on the Chuck's other side, so that by the time the signal laps at Upper Brighton and Enfield, you need almost surveillance-grade attenuation to filter it out of the EM miasma of cellular and interconsole phone transmissions and TP's EM auras that crowd the FM fringes from every side. Unless, that is, your tuner is lucky enough to be located at the apex of a tall and more or less denuded hill in Enfield, in which case you find yourself right in WWW's centrifugal line of fire. Madame Psychosis has choose chatty openings and contextual filler. Her hour is compact and no nonsense. After the music fades, her shadow holds collated sheets up and riffles them slightly, so the sound of paper is broadcast. Obesity, she says. Obesity with hypnogonadism. Also, morbid obesity. Nodular leprosy with leonine faces. The engineer can see her silhouette lift a cup as she pauses, which reminds him of the millennial fizzy in his book bag. She says, the acromegalic and hyperkeratostistic, the enretic, this year of all years, the spasmodically Tortocolic. The student engineer, a predoctoral transuranial metallurgist working off massive GSI debt, locks the levels and fills out the left side of his timesheet and ascends with his book bag through a trailage of interneural stairways with semitic 
ideograms and developer smell and past snack bar and billiard hall and modem banks and extensive student counseling offices around the rostral lamina. All oh, the little used many stared neuroform way up to the ottery red fire door of the union's rooftop, leaving Madame Psychosis as is S.O.P. alone with her show and screen in the shadowless chill. She's mostly alone in there when she's on air. Every so often there's a guest, but the guest will usually get introduced and then not say anything. The monologues seem both free associative and intricately structured, not unlike nightmares. There's no telling what'll be up on a given night. If there's one even remotely consistent theme, it's maybe film and film cartridges. Early and mostly Italian neorealist and mostly German expressionist celluloid film. Never new wave. Thumbs up on Peterson Broughton and Dolly Buñuel and down on Darren Hamid. Passionate about Antonioni's slower stuff and some Russian guy named Tarkovsky. Sometimes Ozu and Bresson out of fiction for the hoary dramaturgy of one Sir Herbert Tree, bizarre KLS admiration for Gormeisters, Peckinpah, De Palma, Tarantino, positively poisonous on the subject of Fellini's Eight and a Half, exceptionally conversant WRT avant garde celluloid and avant and a pre digital cartridges, anti confluential cinema. Footnote 61. Footnote 61. An a pre-garde digital movement, a.k.a. digital parallelism, and cinema of chaotic stasis, characterized by a stubborn and possibly intentionally irritating refusal of different narrative lines to merge into any kind of meaningful confluence. The school derives somewhat from both the narrative Brady kinesism of Antonioni and the disassociative formalism of Stan Brackage and Hollis Frampton, comprising periods in the careers of the late Beth B., the Snow Brothers, Vigdis Simpson, and the late J.O. Incandenza, middle period. Brutalism, found drama, etc. Also, highly literate on U.S. sports, football in particular, which fact the student engineer finds dissonant. Madam takes one phone call per show at random. Mostly, she solos. The show kind of flies itself. She could do it in her sleep, behind the screen. Sometimes, she seems very sad. The engineer likes to monitor the broadcast from a height, the union's rooftop, summer sun and winter wind. The more correct term for an asthmatic's inhaler is nebulizer, the engineer's graduate research specialty is the carbonated translithium particles created and destroyed billions of times a second in the core of a cold fusion ring. Most of the lithioids can't be smashed or studied and exist mostly to explain gaps and incongruities in annulation equations. Once, last year, Madame Psychosis had the student engineer write out the home lab process for turning uranium oxide powder into good old fissionable U-235. Then she read it on the air, between a Baraka poem and her critique of the Steeler Defense's double-slot secondary. It's something a bright high schooler could cook and took less than three minutes to read on air and didn't involve one classified procedure or one piece of hardware not gettable from any decent chemical supply outlet in Boston. But there was no small unpleasantness about it from the MIT administration, which it's well known MIT is in bed with defense. The hot fuel recipe was the one bit of verbal intercourse the engineers had with Madame Psychosis that didn't involve straight levels and cues. The Union's soft latex polymer roof is cerebrally domed and a cloudy piameter pink, except in spots where it's eroded down to pasty gray, and everywhere textured the bulging rooftop with sulci and bulbous convolutions. 
From the air, it looked wrinkled. From the roof's fire door, its innermost nauseous system of serpentine trenches, like water slides in hell. The union itself, the late A-Y-V-F, Ricky's summus opus, is a great hollow brain frame, an endowed memorial to the North American seat of very high tech. And it's not as ghastly as out of tone as suppose it must be. Though the vitreally inflated balloon eyes, deorbited and hung by twined blue cords from the second floor's optic chiasme to flank the wheelchair accessible front ramp, take a bit of getting used to, and some, like the engineer, never do get comfortable with them and use the less garish auditory side doors and the abundant sulcus fissures and gyrus bulges of the slick latex roof make rain drainage complex and footing chancy at best. So there's not a whole lot of recreational strolling up here, although a kind of safety balcony of skull-colored polybutylene resin which curves around the midbrain from the inferior frontal sulcus to the parato-occipital sulcus a halowish ring at the level of like eaves, demanded by the Cambridge Fire Department over the heated pro-mimetic protests of topological rickyites over in the Architecture Department, which the MIT administration, trying to placate rickyites and CFD Fire Marshal both, had had the pre-molded resin injected with dyes to render it the distinctively icky brown shot off-white of living skull so that the balcony resembles at once corporal bone and numinous aura. Which balcony means that even the worst latex slip and slide off the steeply curved cerebrum's edge would mean a fall of only a few meters to the broad butylene platform, from which a venous blue emergency ladder can be detached and lowered to extend down past the superior temporal gyrus and pons and abducent to hook up with the polyurethane basilar stem artery and allow a safe shimmy down to the good old oblongata just outside the rubberized metis at ground zero. Topside in the bitter river wind, wearing a khaki parka with a fake fur fringed, the student engineer makes his way and settles into the first intraparietal sulcus that catches his fancy, makes a kind of nest in the soft trench. The convoluted latex is filled with those little FHC styrofoam peanuts everything industrially soft is filled with. And the pyamator surface gives rather like one of those old beanbag chairs of more innocent times. He settles in and back with his millennial fizzy and inhaler and cigarette and pocket-sized Heathkick digital FM band receiver under a high CO night sky that makes the star's points look extra sharp. The Boston PM is 10 degrees Celsius. The post-central sulcus he sits in is just outside the circumference of the YYY, Ariel's high-speed spin. So, five meters overhead, its tips aircraft light describes a blurred oval, vascularly hued. His FM receiver's power cells tested daily against the low-temp lab's mercuric resistors are fresh. The wooferless tuners sound tinny and crisp, so that Madame sounds like a faithful but radically miniaturized copy of her studio self. Those with saddle noses, those with atrophic limbs, and yes, chemists and pure math majors, also those with atrophic neck. Scleroderma, adulterum, them that seep, the serodermatoctic. Come one, come all, this circular says. The hydrocephalic, the tabescent, and cachetic, and anorexic, the Bragg's diseased, in their heavy red rinds of flesh, the dermally wine-stained or carbuncular or streocryptoptic, or God forbid, all three. Marin Amat syndrome, you say? Come on down. The psoriatic, the eczematically shunned, and the scrofulodermic, bell-shaped, steotopagiacs, 
in your special slacks. Afflictees of Pityriasis rosia. It says here, Come all ye hateful, blessed are the poor in body, for they... The pulsing aircraft alert light of the aerial is magenta, a sharp and much closer star now, with his fingers laced behind his head, reclined and gazing upward, listening. The centrifugal whirls speed making its tip's light trail color across the eyes. The light's oval is a bloody halo over the very barest of all possible heads. Madame Psychosis has done UHID stuff before, once or twice. He is listening to her read four levels below the oblongated recess that becomes the heating shaft's nubbin of spine, ad-lib style reading from one of the PR circulars of the union of the hideously and improbably deformed, an agnostic style 12-step support group deal for what it calls the aesthetically challenged. Footnote 62. At the zenith of the self-help group movement in the BS mid-1990s, there were estimated to be over 600 wholly distinct step-based fellowships in the USA, all modeled, however heretically or flakily, on the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous by YDAU. The number has dropped to about one-third of that. She sometimes reads circulars and catalogs and PR-type things, though not regularly. Some things take several successive shows to get through. Ratings stay solid. Listeners hang in. The engineer's pretty sure he'd hang in, even if he weren't paid to. He does like to settle into a sulcus and smoke slowly and exhale up past the blurred red ellipse of the aerial monitoring. Madame's themes are at once unpredictable and somehow rhythmic, more like probability waves for subhadronics than anything else. Footnote 63. The Student Engineer's Analogy. The student engineer has never once seen Madame Psychosis enter or leave WYYY. She probably takes the elevator. It's 22 October in the ONAN, Year of the Depend Adult Undergarment. Like most marriages, Averill and the late James Incandenza's was an evolved product of concordance and compromise. And the scholastic curriculum at AETA is the product of negotiated compromises between Averill's academic hardassery and James's and Schitt's keen sense of athletic pragmatics. It is because of Averill, who quit MIT entirely and went down to halftime at Brandeis and even turned down an extremely plummy type stipend and fellowship at Radcliffe's Bunting Institute that first year to design and assume the helm of ETA's curriculum. That the Enfield Tennis Academy is the only athletic focus type school in North America that still adheres to the trivium and quadrivium of the hard ass classical LAS traditions. Footnote 64. Not 100% clear on this, but the thrust is that the T and Q are the two basic courses of study, leading historically to the like 18th century equivalent of a high school diploma and a BA or maybe an MA respectively at nodes of hoary classicality like Oxford and Cambridge U during the time of Samuel Johnson, more or less the original grammatical, lexical and pedagogical hard ass, and that the trivium makes you take grammar, logic, rhetoric, and then, if you're still standing, you get the quadrivium of math, geometry, astronomy, and music, and that none of the classes, including the potentially lightweight astronomy and music, were in fact lightweight, which is one possible reason why the portraits of all these classical and neoclassical BAs and doctors of philosophy at Oxford and Cambridge look so pale and wasted and haunted and grim. Not to mention that the only day ETAs get off classes is Sunday, partly to make up for how much they're away from classroom on trips, and back at ETA classless Sunday is a three-session day on courts, all of which strikes people outside academies as almost fanatically brutal. 
For more general pedagogy here, see P. Beasley's somewhat frumpy, undated B.S. era Revival of the Humanities in American Education. Or better yet, Dr. A. M. Incandenza's updated version of same, with its prose updated and typos eradicated, an argument rather more keenly honed, available on CD-ROM through the interlace at cornup3.com, or in trade paperback from Cornell University Press, 3rd edition, copyright, Year of the Tux Medicated Pad. And thus, one of the very few extant sport academies that make a real stab at being a genuine, pre-college school, and not just an iron curtainish jock factory. But Stitt never let Incandenza forget what the place was supposed to be about, and so Averill's flinty mensana pedagogy wasn't diluted so much as ad valorized, pragmatically focused toward the corporo potis type. Gold kids were coming up the hill to give their childhoods for some ETA twists, Arold allowed into the classic LAS path are, e.g., that the seven subjects of the T and Q are mixed and not divided into quadrivial upper class versus trivial ephebic, that ETA geometry classes pretty much ignored the study of closed figures, except rectangles, to concentrate, also except for Thorpe's trigonometry of cubes, which is elective and mostly aesthetic, for two increasingly brutal semesters on the involution and expansion of bare angles. That the quadrivial requirement of astronomy has at ETA become a two-term elementary optic survey, since vision issues are obviously more germane to the game, and since all the hardware required for everything from aphotic to apochromatic lens work were, and are, right there in the lab off the Comad tunnel. Music's been pretty much bagged. Plus, the triviumoid fetish for classical oratory has, by now at ETA, been converted to a wide range of history and studio courses in various types of entertainment, mostly recorded film. Again, way too much of incandenza's lavish equipment lying around not to exploit, plus the legally willed and endowed for perpetuity presence on the academic payroll of Mrs. Prickett, Mr. Ogilvy, Mr. Disney R. Leith, and Ms. Soma Richardson Levy O'Brien Chawoff, the late founder director's loyal sound engineer, best boy, production assistant, and third favorite actress, respectively. Plus, also, the six-term entertainment requirement because students hoping to prepare for careers as professional athletes are by intention training also to be entertainers, albeit of a deep and special sort, was in Candenza's line one of the few philosophical points he had to pretty much ram down the throats of both Averill and Stitt, who was pushing hard for some mix of theology and the very grim ethics of Kant. Mario in Candenza has sat in on a back row stool for every session of an ETA entertainment department offering ever since he was finally, three years ago, December, asked to disenroll from the Winter Hills Special School in Cambridgeport for cheerfully declining even to try to learn to really read, explaining he'd way rather listen and watch. And he is a fanatical listener-observer. He treats the lavish Tatsuoko Fringe FM band tuner in the living room of the headmaster's house like kids of three generations past, listening the way other kids watch TP, opting for mono and sitting right up close to one of the speakers with his head cocked, dog-like, listening, staring into that special pocket of near-middle distance reserved for the serious listener. He really does have to sit right up close to listen to 60 minutes plus minus when he's over at the HMH. Footnote 65. ETA's moniker for the headmaster's house. With C.T. and sometimes Hal at his mother's late suppers because Averill has some auditory thing about broadcast sound and gets the howling fantods from any voice that does not exit a living corporal head. 
And though Avros made it clear that Mario's free at any time to activate and align the Tatsuoka's ghostly green tuner to whatever he wishes, he keeps the volume so low that he has to be lowered onto a low coffee table and lean in and almost put his ear up against the woofer's tremble and concentrate closely to hear YYY's signal over the conversation in the dining room, which tends to get sort of maniacally high-pitched toward the end of supper. Avril never actually asks Mario to keep it down. He does it out of unspoken consideration for her thing about sound. Another of her unspoken but stressful things involves issues of enclosure, and the HMH has no interior doors between rooms, and not even much in the way of walls. And the living and dining rooms are separated only by a vast, multi-leveled tangle of houseplants in pots and on little stools of different heights, and arrayed under hanging UV lamps of an intensity that tends to give the diners strange little patterns of tan that differ according to where someone usually sits at the table. Hal sometimes complains privately to Mario that he gets more than enough UV during the day, thank you very much. The plants are incredibly lush and hale, and sometimes threaten to block off the whole easement from dining to living room. And the rope-handled Brazilian machete CT had mounted on the wall by the tremulous china case has stopped really being a joke. The moms calls the houseplants her green babies, and she has a rather spectacular thumb, plant-wise, for Canadian. The leucodramatic, the xanthodantic, the maxillofacially swollen, those with distorted orbits of all kinds, get out from under the sun's cove lighting is what this is, come in from the spectral rain. Madame Psychosis's broadcast accent is not Boston. There are R's, for one thing. And there's no cultured Cambridge stutter. It's the accent of someone who's spent time either losing a southern lilt or cultivating one. It's not flat and twangy like Stesis's, and it's not a drawl like the people at Gainesville's Academy. Her voice itself is sparely modulated and strangely empty, as if she were speaking from inside a small box. It's not bored or laconic or ironic or tongue-in-cheek. The basilisk breathed and pyreic. It's reflective but not judgmental somehow. Her voice seems low-depth familiar to Mario, the way certain childhood smells will strike you as familiar and oddly sad. All ye peronic or teratoidal, the phrenologically malformed, the superlatively lesioned, the endocrinologically malodorous of whatever ilk. Run. Don't walk on down. The asovulvous nosed, the radically ectomied, the morbidly diaphoretic with a hanky in every pocket the chronically granulomitis, the one it says here, the ones the crew call two-baggers. One bag for your head, and one bag for the observer's head, in case your bag falls off. The hated and dateless and shunned who keep to the shadows, those who undress only in front of their pets. The quote, aesthetically challenged, leave your laserettes and woblets. I'm reading this right now. Your closets and cellars and TP tableaus find nurturing and support and the inner resources to face your own unblinking sight, is what this goes on to say. A bit overheatedly, maybe. Is it our place to say? It says here, hugs, not uggs. It says, come down the veil of the type and token. Come learn to love what's hidden inside, to hold and cherish. 
the almost unbelievably thick ankled, the kyphotic and lordotic, the irremediably cellulitic. It says progress, not perfection. It says never perfection. The fatally pulchritudinous, welcome. The actoonizing, side by side, with the metosoid, the papuled, the macular, the albinic, medusas and odalisks, both, come find common ground, all meeting rooms, windowless. That's in Eitel, all meeting rooms, windowless. Plus, the music she's cued for this inflectionless reading is weirdly compelling. You can never predict what it will be, but over time, some kind of pattern emergence, uh, trend or rhythm. Tonight's background fits somehow as she reads. There's not any real forwardness to it. You don't sense it straining to get anywhere. The thing it makes you see as she reads is something heavy, swinging slowly at the end of a long rope. It's minor key enough to be eerie against the empty lilt of the voice and the clinks of tines in China as Mario's relations eat turkey salad and steamed croziers and drink lager and milk and von Blanc from Hull over behind the plants bathed in purple light. Mario can see the back of the mom's head high above the table and then over to the left Hal's bigger right arm and then Hal's profile when he lowers it to eat. There's a ball by his plate. The ETA players seem to need to eat six or seven times a day. Hal and Mario had walked over for 2100 supper at HMH after Hal had read something from Mr. Leith's class and then disappeared for about half an hour while Mario stood supported by his police lock and waited for him. Mario rubs his nose with the heel of his hand. Madame Psychosis has an unironic but generally gloomy outlook on the universe in general. One of the reasons Mario's obsessed with her show is that he's somehow sure Madame Psychosis cannot herself sense the compelling beauty and light she projects over the air. Somehow. He has visions of interfacing with her and telling her she'd feel a lot better if she listened to her own show, he bets. Madame Psychosis is one of only two people Mario would love to talk to, but would be scared to try. The word periodic pops into his head. Hey, Hal, he calls across the plants. Like for months in the spring semester of YDPAH, she referred to her own programs as Madame's Downer Lit Hour and read depressing book after depressing book. Good morning, Midnight and Maggie, A Girl of the Streets, and Giovanni's Room and Under the Volcano, plus a truly ghastly Brett Ellis period during Lent, in a monotone really slowly, night after night. Mario sits on the low little Vandero knockoff coffee table with bowed legs, the table, with his head cocked right up against the speaker and his claws in his lap. His toes tend to point inward when he sits, The background music is both predictable and, within that predictability, surprising. It's periodic. It suggests expansion without really expanding. It leads up to the kind of inevitability it denies. It is heavily digital, but with something of a choral bouquet, but unhuman. Mario thinks of the word haunting like... In a haunting echo of thus and such, Madame Psychosis's cued music, which the student engineer never chooses or even sees her bring in, is always terribly obscure. Footnote 66. Some MITs are compulsive about taping the shows and then listening to the musics again and trying to track them down in stores and college archives, not unlike the way some of their parents had killed whole evenings trying to parse out the lyrics on R.E.M. and Pearl Jam tapes, etc.
but often just as queerly powerful and compelling as her voice and show itself, the MIT community feels. It tends to give you the feeling there's an in-joke that you and she alone are in on. Very few devoted WYYY listeners sleep well, Monday through Friday. Mario has horizontal breathing trouble sometimes, but other than that, he sleeps like a babe. Avril and Candenza still sticks with the old Lazlet region practice of taking just tea and nibbles at U.S. supper time and waiting to eat seriously until right before bed. Cultured Canadians tend to think vertical digestion makes the mind unkeen. Some of Oren and Mario and Hal's earliest memories are of nodding off at the dining table and being gently carried by a very tall man to bed. This was in a different house. Madame Psychosis's cued music stir very early memories of Mario's father. Avril was more than willing to take some good-natured guff about her inability to eat before twenty-two thirty hour. Prandial music holds little charm or associations for Hal who, like most of the kids on double daily drills, makes fists around his utensils and eats like a wild dog. Nor excluded the utterly noseless, not the hideously wall and cross-eyed, nor either the ergodic of St. Anthony, the leprous, the ralicilli formally eruptive, or even the sarcomid of Kaposi. Hal and Mario probably eat listen late over at the HMH twice a week. Avril likes to see them outside the awkward formality of her position at ETACT's, the same at home and office. Both Avril and Tavis's bedrooms are on the second floor. As a matter of fact, right next to each other. The only other room up there is Avril's personal study with a big color Xerox of M. Hamilton as Oz's West Witch on the door and custom fiber wiring for a trimodem TP console. A stairway runs from her study down the back side of HMH North, down to the tributary tunnel leading to the main tunnel to come at so Avril can commute over to ETA below ground. The HMH tunnel connects with the main at a point between the pump room and calm ad, meaning Avril never, like, hunches idly past the pump room, which fact Hal obviously endorses. Late suppers at HMH for Hal are limited by Delint to twice-a-week tops because they get him excused from dawn drills, which also means late-night mischief possibilities. Sometimes they bring Canada's John, no relation, Wayne, over with them whom Mrs. I likes and speaks to animatedly, even though he rarely says anything the whole time he's there, and also eats like a wild dog, sometimes neglecting utensils altogether. Avril also likes it when Axford comes. Axford has a hard time eating, and she likes to exhort him to eat. Very rarely any more does Hal bring Pemulus or Jim Strock to whom Avril is so faultlessly, brutally polite that the dining room's tension raises hair. Whenever Avril parts ficus leaves to check, Mario still hunched, pigeon-toed, and cocked in the same RCA victorish posture, with the little horizontal forehead crease that means he's either listening or thinking hard. The multiple amputee the prosthetically malmatched, the snaggle toothed, waddled, weak chinned, and walrus cheeked, the palate clefted, the really large port, the excessively but not necessarily lycanthropically her suit, the pin headed, the convulsly dreadic, the Parkinsonianly tremulous, the stunted and gnarled the teratoid of overall visage, the twisted and hunched and humped and haliotic, the in any way asymmetrical, the rodential and saurian and equine looking. Hey, how? The trinostraled, the invaginate of mouth and eye, those with those dark loose bags under their eyes that hang halfway down their faces. 
those with Cushing's disease, those who look like they have Down syndrome, even though they don't have Down syndrome. You decide. You be the judge. It says you are welcome, regardless of severity. Severity is in the eye of the sufferer, it says. Pain is pain. Crow's feet, birthmark, rhinoplasty that didn't take, mole, overbite, a bad hair year. The YYY student engineer in his sulcus contemplates the moon, which looks sort of like a full moon that somebody's bashed in a little bit with a hammer. Madame Psychosis asks rhetorically whether the circulars left anyone out. The engineer finishes his fizzy and makes ready to descend again for the hour's close, his skin turned toward the terrible cerebral chill off the Charles, which is windy and blue. Sometimes Madame Psychosis takes one random call to start 60 plus minus. Tonight, the one caller she ends by taking has a cultured stutter and invites MP and the YYY community to consider the fact that the moon, which of course, as any sot knows, revolves around the earth, does not itself revolve. Is this true? He says it is. That it just stays there, hidden and disclosed by our round shadow's rhythms, but never revolving that it never turns its face away. The little Heath kid can't receive signals inside the cerebrum subdural stairwells during descent, but the student engineer can anticipate she'll make no direct reply. Her sign-off is more dead air. She almost reminds the engineer of certain types in high school, whom everyone adored because you sensed it made no difference to them whether you adored them. It had sure made a difference to the engineer, though, who hadn't been invited to even one graduation party with his inhaler and skin. The dessert Avril serves when Hal's over is Mrs. Clark's infamous high-protein gelatin squares, available in bright red or bright green, sort of like jello on steroids. Mario's wild for them. C.T. clears the table and loads the dishwasher, since he didn't cook, and Hal gets into his coat at, like, 010 hour. Mario's still listening to the YYY nightly sign-off, which takes a while because they not only list the station's kilowattage specs, but go through proofs for the formulae by which the specs are derived. CT always drops at least one plate out in the kitchen and then bellows. Avril always brings some hell jello squares in to Mario and adopts a mock dry tone and tells how it's been reasonably nice to see him outside Le Bâtiment Sacrifié. The whole thing to Hal sometimes gets ritualistic and almost hallucinatory. The post prandial farewell routine. Hal stands under the big frame poster of Metropolis and whomps his gloves together casually and tells Mario there's no reason for him to leave too. Hal's going to blast down the hill for a bit. Avril and Mario always smile, and Avril asks casually what his plans are. Hal always whomps his gloves together and smiles up at her and says, Make trouble. And Avril always puts on a sort of mock stern expression and says, Do not, under any circumstances, have fun which Mario still always finds clutch your stomach funny every time, week after week. And it House Drug and Alcohol Recovery House is the sixth of seven exterior units on the grounds of an Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital complex that, from the height of the ATH SCME 2100 Industrial Displacement Fan, or... Enfield Tennis Academy's hilltop, resembles seven moons orbiting a dead planet. The hospital itself, a VA facility of iron-colored brick and steep slate roofs, is closed and cordoned, bright pine boards nailed across every possible access and aperture, with really stern government signs about trespassing. Enfield Marine was built during either World War II or Korea, when there were ample casualties and much convalescence. 
About the only people who use Anfield Marine Complex in a VA-related way now seem to be wild-eyed old Vietnam veterans in fatigue jackets de-sleeved to make vests, or else drastically old Korea vets who are now senile or terminally alcoholic, or both. The hospital building itself, stripped of equipment and copper wire, defunct Enfield Marine stays solvent by maintaining several smaller buildings on the complex's grounds. Buildings the size of, like, prosperous homes, which used to house VA doctors and support staff and leasing them to different state-related health agencies and services. Each building has a unit number that increases with the unit's distance from the defunct hospital and with its proximity along a rutted cement roadlet that extends back from the hospital's parking lot to a steep ravine that overlooks a particularly unpleasant part of Brighton's M.A. Commonwealth Avenue and its Green Line train tracks. Unit number one right by the lot in the hospital's afternoon shadow, is leased by some agency that seems to employ only guys who wear turtlenecks. The place counselors, wild-eyed Vietnam vets for certain very delayed stress disorders, is a methadone clinic overseen by the same MA Division of Substance Abuse Services that licenses Ennit House. Customers for the services of Units No. 1 and No. 2 arrive around sunup and form long lines. The customers for unit number one tend to congregate in like-minded groups of three or four and gesture a lot and look wild-eyed and generally pissed off in some broad geopolitical way. The customers for the methadone clinic tend to arrive looking even angrier as a rule, and their early morning eyes tend to bulge and flutter like the eyes of the choked. But they do not congregate. Rather stand or lean along number two's, long walkways railing, arms crossed, alone, brooding, solo acts, standoffish. It's a strange sight. And if Don Gately had ever once seen a ballet, he would, as an Ennett House resident, from his sun-up smoking station on the fire escape outside the five-man bedroom upstairs, have seen the movements and postures necessary to maintain this Isolation in union as balletic. The other big difference between units one and two is that the customers of number two leave the building deeply changed, their eyes not only back in their heads, but peaceful, if a bit glazed. But anyway, in general, just way better put together than when they arrived while the number one's wild-eyed patrons tend to exit number one looking even more stressed and historically aggrieved than when they went in. When Don Gately was in the very early part of his Ennett House residency, he almost got discharged for teaming up with a bad news methadrine addict from New Bedford and sneaking out after curfew across the EMPHH complex in the middle of the night to attach a big sign on the narrow front door of Unit Number 2's methadone clinic. The sign said, Closed until further notice by order, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The first staffer at the methadone clinic doesn't get there to open until 800 hours. And yet, it's been mentioned how the Number 2 customers always begin to show up with twisting hands and bulging eyes at like dawn to wait. And Gately and the speed freak from New Bedford had never seen anything like the psychic crisis and near riot among these semi-ex junkies, pallid, blade-slender, chain-smoking homosexuals and bearded bruiser types and leather berets, women with mohawks and multiple sticks of gum in, upscale trust fund fritterers with shiny cars and computerized jewelry who'd arrive as they'd been doing like hyper-conditioned rats for years, many of them, arrived at sunup with their eyes protruding and with Kleenexes at their noses and scratching their arms and standing on first one foot and then the other, doing basically everything but truly congregating wild for chemical relief, ready to stand in the cold, exhaling steam for hours for that relief, who'd arrived with the sun and now seemed to be informed that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was suddenly going to withdraw the prospect of that relief until, 
and this is what really seemed to drive them right over the edge, out there in the lot, until further notice. Ape shit has rarely enjoyed so literal a denotation. At the sound of the first window pane breaking and the sight of a blown out old whore trying to hit a leather vested biker with an old pre-metric grass grows by inches but it dies by feet sign from number two's clinic's pathetic front lawn, the methadrine addict began laughing so hard that she dropped the binoculars from the ended house upstairs fire escape where they were watching at like 6.30 hours. And the binocular fell and hit the roof of one of the Ennett House counselor's cars right below in the little roadlet with a ringing clunk just as he was pulling in. The counselor, his name was Calvin Thrust, and he was four years sober and a former New York City porn actor who'd gone through the house himself and now took absolutely zero in terms of shit from any of the residents. And his pride and joy was his customized vet, and the binoculars made rather a nasty dent. And plus, they were the house manager's amateur ornithology binoculars and had been borrowed out of the back office without explicit permission. And the long fall and impact didn't do them a bit of good, to say the least. And Gately and the methadrine addict got pinched and put on full house restriction and very nearly kicked out. The addict from New Bedford picked up the aminating needle a couple weeks after that anyway and was discovered by a night staffer simultaneously playing air guitar and polishing the lids of all the donated cans in the house pantry way after lights out, stark naked and sheened with meth sweat. And after the formality of a urine, she was given the old administrative boot. Over a quarter of Incoming Ennett House residents get discharged for dirty urine within their first 30 days. And it's the same at all other Boston halfway houses. And the girl ended up back in New Bedford and then, within like three hours of hitting the streets, got picked up by New Bedford's finest on an old default warrant and sent to Framingham Women's for a one to two bit and got found one morning in her bunk with a kitchen rig shiv protruding from her privates and another in her neck and a thoroughly eliminated personal map. And Gately's individual counselor, Jean M., brought Gately the news and invited him to see the methadrine addict's demise as a clear case of there but for the grace of God go with D.W. Gately. Unit number three, across the roadlet from number two, is unoccupied but getting reconditioned for lease. It's not boarded up, and the Enfield Marine Maintenance guys go in there a couple of days a week with tools and power cords and make a god-awful racket. Pat Montesian hasn't yet been able to find out what sort of group misfortune number three will be devoted to servicing. Unit number four, more or less equidistant from both the hospital parking lot and the steep ravine, is a repository for Alzheimer's patients with VA pensions. The number four residents wear jammies 24-7, the diapers underneath giving them a lumpy and toddlerish aspect. The patients are frequently visible at number four's windows in jammies, splayed and open-mouthed, sometimes shrieking, sometimes just mutely open-mouthed, splayed against the windows. They give everybody at Ended House the howling fantods. One ancient retired Air Force nurse does nothing but scream help for hours at a time from a second-story window. Since the Ennett House residents are drilled in a Boston AA recovery program that places great emphasis on asking for help, the retired shrieking Air Force nurse is the object of a certain grim amusement, sometimes. Not six weeks ago, a huge stolen help wanted sign was found attached to number four siding right below the retired shrieking nurse's window. And the number four's director was less than amused and demanded that Pat Montesian determine and punish the Ennett House residents responsible. And Pat had delegated the investigation to Don Gately, and though Gately had a pretty good idea of who the perps were, he didn't have the heart to really press and kick ass over something so much like what he'd done himself when new and cynical. So, the whole thing pretty much blew over. 
Unit number five, kitty corner across the little street from Ennit House, is for catatonics and various vegetable-ish fetal-positioned mental patients, subcontracted to a Commonwealth outreach agency by overcrowded LTIs. Unit number five is referred to, for reasons Gately's never been able to pinpoint, as the shed. Footnote 67. A couple of the Enfield Marine Public Health Hospital security officers know ETA's Hal Incandenza from having met his brother Mario when James O. Incandenza had hired the officers as lineless figurant background extra cops for both Dial C for concupiscence and Three Cheers for Cause and Effect. The EM officers are sometimes down in the unexamined life tavern on blind bouncer nights when Hal is in there with, like, Axford. Hal hitting the life quite a bit less frequently than Axford and Struck and Trolch, who rarely miss a bring-your-own Braille ID theme night at the unexamined life and seem able to function during AM drills even after several parasol mudslides or the house specialty blue flame cognac-based things you have to blow out before sipping from their huge blue-rimmed snifters. The EM cops are both young, dim, big, good, regular blue, literally collar Boston guys. High school tackles, not going soft, their jowls razor-burned and purpling with gin. And they'll sometimes regale the ETA's WRT some of the more colorful EM specimens they're paid to keep secure. There's something a little compulsive about the cop's particular interest in the number five chronic catatonics especially. The EM cops call unit number five the shed, they say, because its residents don't seem housed there so much as more like stored there. The EM cops pronounce stored stewad, the chronic catatonics themselves they refer to as objet d'art, which is something else Don G over in number six has never understood. Over mudslides, they'll often give little thumbnail anecdotes about various of the shed's objet d'arts, and one of the reasons why they regale the ETAs only when Hal's down there at the unexamined life is that Hal is the only ETA who seems truly interested, which is the sort of thing your veteran off-duty cop can always sense. E.g., one of the object darts they're into is the lady who sits very still with her eyes closed. The cops explain that the lady is not catatonic in the strict sense of catatonic, but rather a DP, which is a mental health facility slang for debilitatingly phobic. Her deal is apparently that she's almost psychotically terrified of the possibility that she might be either blind or paralyzed or both. So, e.g., she keeps her eyes shut tight 24-7, 365, out of the reasoning that as long as she keeps her eyes shut tight, she can find hope in the possibility that if she was to open them, she'd be able to see, they'd say. But that if she were ever to actually open her eyes and actually not be able to see, she reasons, She's lost that precious, like, margin of hope that she's maybe not blind. Then they run through her similar reasoning behind sitting absolutely motionless out of a phobia of being paralyzed. After each anecdote tale like, they've got, like, an anecdote routine, the EM cops. The shorter EM security officer always uses his tongue to manipulate the little green parasol from one side of his mouth to the other as he holds his snifter tight in both hands and makes his jowls accordionize as he nods and posits that the terrifying thing is that the common unifying symptom of most of the shed's objet darts is a terror so terrifying it makes the object of the terror come true somehow. Which observation always makes both of the big dim working men shiver an identical and kind of almost delicious-looking shiver, pushing their hats back and shaking their heads at their glasses as Hal blows out of the fire of the second blue flame they've brought him, making a wish before he blows. It is, understandably, a pretty quiet place, but in nice weather, 
when its more portable inmates are carried out and placed in the front lawn to take the air, standing there, propped up and staring, they present a tableau it took Gately some time to get used to. A couple newer residents got discharged late in Gately's treatment for tossing firecrackers into the crowd of catatonics on the lawn to see if they could get them to jump around or display effect. On warm nights, one long-limbed, bespectacled lady, who seems more autistic than catatonic, tends to wander out of the shed, wrapped in a bedsheet, and lay her hands on the thin, shiny bark of a silver maple in Number Five's lawn, stands there, touching the tree, until she's missed at bed check and retrieved. And since Gately graduated treatment and took the offer of a live-in staffer's job at Ennett House, he sometimes wakes up in his staff cellar bedroom, down by the payphone and tonic machine, and looks out the sooty ground level window by his bed, and watches the catatonic touching the tree in her sheet and glasses, illuminated by Calm Avenue's neon, or the weird sodium light that spills down from the sooty tennis prep school overhead on its hill. He'll watch her, standing there, and feel an odd, chilled empathy he tries not to associate with watching his mother pass out on some piece of living room chintz. Unit number six, right up against the ravine on the end of the rutted road's east side, is in it house, drug, and alcohol recovery house. Three stories of whitewashed New England brick, with the brick showing in pouches through the whitewash, a mansard roof that sheds green shingles, a scaper's fire escape at each upper window, and a back door no resident is allowed to use, and a front office around on the south side with huge protruding bay windows that yield a view of ravine weeds and the unpleasant stretch of Commonwealth Avenue. The front office is the director's office and its bay windows, the house's single attractive feature, are kept spotless by whatever residents get front office windows for their weekly chore. The mansard's lower slope encloses attics on both the male and female sides of the house. The attics are accessed from trap doors in the ceiling of the second floor and are filled to the beams with trash bags and trunks, the unclaimed possessions of residents who've up and vanished sometime during their term. The shrubbery all around Ennett House's first story looks explosive, ballooning in certain unpruned parts, and there are candy wrappers and styrofoam cups trapped throughout the shrub's green levels and gaudy homemade curtains below from the second story's female side's bedroom windows, which are open what seems like all year round. Unit number seven is on the west side of the street's end, sunk in hill shadow and teetering right on the edge of the eroding ravine that leads down to the avenue. Number seven is in bad shape, boarded up and unmaintained and deeply slumped at the red roof's middle, as if shrugging its shoulders at some pointless indignity. For an Ennett House resident entering Unit Number 7, which can easily be entered through the detachable pine board over an old kitchen window, is cause for immediate administrative discharge. Since Unit Number 7 is infamous for being the place where Ennett House residents who want to secretly relapse with substances sneak in and absorb substances and apply visine and chlorets and then try to get back across the street in time for 23.30 curfew without getting pinched. Behind Unit Number 7 begins far and away the biggest hill in Enfield, Massachusetts. The hillside is fenced, off-limits, densely wooded and without sanctioned path. Because a legit route involves walking north all the way up the rutted road through the parking lot, past the hospital, down the steep curved driveway to Warren Street, and all the way back south, Warren to Commonwealth, almost half of all Ennett House residents negotiate Number 7's back fence and climb the hillside each morning, shortcutting their way to minimum wage temp jobs at like the Provident Nursing Home or Shuko Missed Medical Pressures System, etc., over the hill up calm or custodial and kitchen jobs at the rich tennis school for blonde, gleaming tennis kids on what used to be the hilltop. Don Gately's been told that the school's maze of tennis courts lies now on what used to be the hill's 
hilltop before the Academy's burly, cigar-chomping tennis court contractors shaved the curved top off and rolled the new top flat, the whole long, loud process sending all sorts of damaging avalanche-type debris rolling down and all over Enfield Marines Unit Number 7, something over which you can sure bet the Enfield Marine VA administration litigated years back. And... But Gately doesn't know that E.T.A.'s balding of the hill is why number seven can still stand empty and unrepaired. Enfield Tennis Academy still has to pay full rent every month on what is almost buried. <laughs>